Genesis chapter 9. I want to introduce a new series for the month of February, The African Presence in the Scripture. The African Presence in the Scripture. I'm going to read verse 1 of Genesis 9. We'll come away from this and we'll come back to it. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Father, we thank you for yourself. Thank you for the privilege we have to worship you. All the songs and hymns and spiritual songs have been directed to you, the giving, the greeting, all that we've done is to give you honor in your presence. And now as we come to the word of God, we ask that the word of God would serve as a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. As always, help us to be not just hearers, but doers of your word. May we be guided by the spirit of God this morning, and as always, may the words of my mouth, the meditation that is in my heart, may it be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, for you are my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Carter G. Woodson is primarily responsible for us honoring February as what we call Black History Month. It ought not to have been needed to isolate a time to celebrate. In fact, it was never in his mind to somehow separate what is called black history from American history. But in 1926, 21 through 26, he is probably the most popular scholar to ever do research on African or African-American history. Initially, he advocated a week, a week so that our nation can focus on the fact that African Americans, Negroes, are included into history. I know that we've heard, well, we got the shortest month. But as a historian, he chose February for two reasons primarily, a week in February to be celebrated the week of the 12th and the 14th, because two key events took place in the month of February. Number one, Abraham Lincoln was born February 12th. And two, Frederick Douglass was born February the 14th. And because of these two men, February has been chosen. John And James, the brothers who are responsible for the lift every voice and sing, they chose also this song to honor Abraham Lincoln. But the goal was never to isolate. The goal was always to include, to make sure that the African story, the African-American story, the Negro story was included in American history. In the Christian faith, the same has taken place. There really should never even be a series like this, the African presence in the scripture. But just like in society and the neglect, the same thing has taken place when it comes to the word of God. 
For 1,000 years after Christ, one of the things that you would never see, you would never see pictures of God and pictures of Christ. The believers understood what God said in Deuteronomy, that to make no image of deity. And so that was honored. But something happened primarily that the artists began to bring to light pictures, not only of God, pictures of Jesus, but also pictures of the biblical characters themselves. And one artist particularly that was hired, and that was Michelangelo, to do the painting on what would be called the Sistine Chapel. And what he did was that he painted a, a mural on the ceiling that would include primarily all of the Old Testament. All of the Old Testament. And naturally, all of the characters were white. And so this had a tremendous impact upon Christianity. So much and so that even Dr. Evans has written an excellent book, Are Blacks Spiritually Inferior to Whites? And uh, sometimes this is the thought, that if I somehow, a, a white church uh, is, is superior than a black church, white ministry is superior to, to black ministry, White Bible studies are superior to black Bible studies. All of these things happen in our minds because of how we have been trained to think. What I like about the word of God, however, is if you notice, God never puts an emphasis on color. Isn't that wonderful? God never puts an emphasis upon color, and neither should we when it comes to our faith in the Lord Jesus. It is a non-issue when it comes to dignity and respect. When, when God, when Moses wrote in Genesis 9, that whosoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. He says, for in the image of God made he man. It is a non-issue. Color is a non-issue when it comes to dignity and respect of all humanity. It is the same when James writes about how in our praise and in our worship, we, we praise God with our tongue, with one breath, and then we turn around and we curse man, irrespective of his color, with another breath. And he says we ought not to do that because man, all mankind, irrespective of the color of our skin, we are created in the image of God. So every black person, every white person, every brown person, Every red person, every person has dignity because of the image of God in man. It's never, ever an issue when it comes down to dignity. Neither should it be an issue in the family of God. Neither should it be an issue in the church of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, when writing to the Galatians, reminds us of this when he says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave or free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. That's what God wants for his church. We shouldn't put an emphasis upon color, uh, when it comes to brotherhood, when it comes to humanity, color is uh, definitely left to the sovereignty of God. When the prophet Jeremiah is writing about Israel and the fact that they will not change their behavior, their behavior continues to be changed, it is set 
then Jeremiah draws upon the sovereignty of God. And one of the only verses in the Bible that stresses color is a, a passage where he's going to use God's sovereignty in creation to say that Israel will not change. He says in Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23, can the Ethiopian change his skin? Can the leopard change his spot? That's God's sovereignty when it comes to the color of someone's skin. It is something that should be celebrated as God has created us. We see this in the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, when Song of Solomon says, I am black, but beautiful. O oh, ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of cedar, as the curtains of Solomon. That's Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5. That I am black, but I'm beautiful. It should be celebrated. Whatever the color that the sovereignty of God, whatever I've, I've come into the world, whatever the culture, it is, it is celebrated. Whether I'm white or black, it doesn't matter. I'm beautiful. Why? Because the sovereignty of God has brought me here. Something has happened, though, in the church. Goes all the way back, you see, even after somewhere around the 1,000, 2,000, you see, what we find is that someone has taken the word of God and they have manipulated it to the point that skin color, particularly African color, has been used as a curse. The first such passage is a passage where Cain kills his brother Abel. And when Cain kills his brother Abel in Genesis uh, chapter 3, what we find is, is that in that, in that passage, uh, we, we discover in chapter 4, we discover something that's quite unique. God puts a mark on Cain. And somehow that mark came to be known as blackness, that that. The, the mark on Cain was, was blackness. The same is true for Noah, Ham's son, uh, Noah's son Ham, who sees his, his father's nakedness, and, and the curse is upon Canaan. And somehow that curse becomes the blackness of skin. You'll see it in the Book of Mormon, if you ever had a chance to read through the Book of Mormon, that, that, that the people who are cursed are cursed with black skin. This, this is why these things are, are needed, because the curse of Cain, the curse of Ham. But Genesis teaches that all humanity has come from one group one single parents and that is Adam and Eve no matter what color you are we are all part of the family the human family and uh, in Genesis chapter 3 verse 20 in the naming of Eve here's what we find and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living do you realize that the person who's sitting next to you, I don't care how they look, that's your brother. That's your sister. In fact, turn to him. Say, hey, bro. Hey, sis. We're getting all the money particulars later, you see, but we part of the same human family. Because Eve is the mother of all living. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians in the 15th chapter, he says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And so the human family has emerged from the same parents, Adam and Eve. 
I find it interesting that Dr. Ham, who has written an excellent book, reminds us on genetics and saying that there's just a small zero point, I think it's eight or nine percent difference from you or any other human being in all of the world. The writer of the book of Acts, Luke, says that by one blood, all nations of the world were made by one blood. That even though there is a small percentage that makes you distinct from me and me from you, yet uh, we are interconnected in humanity because we all have come from the same parents. You know that once God has saw the sin that began with our parents and went on to their children and then to their children, that God had come to a place where he no longer wanted to strive with man. And in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. A hundred and twenty years. And as you know, God raises up Noah, where our context is, and it would be 120 years of preaching that Noah was trying to get the people to repent of their sin. And after 120 year preaching ministry, Noah had eight people in his congregation. And those eight people consisted of Mrs. Noah or Joan. Joan of Ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives. They are the congregation. They go into the ark and God shuts the door. The rains come down, the floods come up, and a year later they emerge from the ark and we come to our passage that will take us into the table of nations, which will set the groundwork for the African presence in the scripture. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. This is almost the same command that God gives to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It would now be Noah's three sons and their wives that would now procreate and be responsible for the population of all of the world. I don't care what ship you came over to America in, whether it was the ships from Europe or ships from Africa, uh, all of our ancestry, we were all on one ship, and that was the ark. The Shem, Ham, and Japheth represent all the nations of this world. God says to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Look at verse 7, and you... Be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And so Shem, Ham, and Japheth actually become the table by which all the nations in the world today spring from. These three sons and their wives will procreate and give us the nations that we have today. Now come with me to chapter 10 of Genesis. And we're not going to take the time to go through all of this. But I want us to see in verse 1. Genesis chapter 10. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them 
were sons born after the flood. From verses 2 all the way to verse 32, we have a description of all the sons of Ham, all the sons of Shem, and all the sons of Japheth. Let me let you know that Japheth and his progenity actually are responsible for all of the European people. All the European people have come from Japheth. I want you to know that all of the African people have come from Ham. And all of the Middle Eastern people, you see, all of the Asiatic people have come from Shem. But they represent all of the tables of the nations in chapter 10. I want us to focus, though, on verses 6 through 14. Look at verse 6 of chapter 10. And the sons of Ham were Cush and Miseran and Phut and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Sheba and Havilah and Sapta and Rama and Saptica and the sons of Rama, Sheba and Dedan. And Cush begot Nimrod and he began to be a mighty hunter in the earth, or mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. In the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Echad, and Kari, and the land of Shinar. And out of all the land went forth Asher, and builded Nineveh, and the city of Rehoboth and Kela, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kela, the same as a great city. And Miseran begat Ludim and Anaimen, and Lahaban, and Naphtahim, and Pathrasim, and Kaluhim, out of whom came Philistim, and Kaphtarim. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I was working on that for about two days. So. How do we know that this is the progenity of Africa? Primarily because of two things. The Kush actually means black or blackness. Ham means burnt or dark. And so what we have in this section is we have the people that would actually migrate to, to Africa. To Africa. Here we have the history of Africa right here in these verses. Now what is interesting is in verse 7, Havilah is mentioned, and I don't want us to pass that too quickly. And that's why a lot of scientists believe that Africa is the beginning of civilization, because here is a river named in the Garden of Eden. If you remember, one of the rivers, Havilah, is connected to the foundation or the crescent of civilization. I think that's important for us. I think it's important. When we come to chapter 11, you remember now that we are all part of the family. Chapter 11 and Genesis, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. It came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there and they said one to another go to let us make brick and burn them thoroughly and they had brick for stone and slime and they for mortar and they said go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon 
the face of the whole earth. One of the things that the people of Shem, the people of Ham, the people of Japheth, notice they're still one family. Though we see these names that will become the table of nations, they're still all one family. They're one family. They're, they're of one language. They are of one speech. And, and, and what they do together is that, that we're going to start what, what would be potentially come as idolatry. Idolatry and pride. Pride always goes before the fall. It was the fall of Lucifer from heaven. It is always the fall. Pride always goes before the fall. These people let us make a name for ourselves. Let's build us a tower. In fact, all in the Middle East, these ziggurats that were found were used for idolatry and idol worship. And so God says, let us go down. Let's go meet with the people. Verse 5 of Genesis 11, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built it. And the Lord said, behold, the people are one. They have all one language, and this they do, begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down. I also think that this is one of the uni, uni plural aspects of the Trinity here. Let us go down. Let us make man in our image. Let us make man after our likeness. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the angels. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Man was made in the image of God. Let us go down. Let's see. Verse 7. Go to, let us go down. And there confounded their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of the whole earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. What is interesting to me, the table of nations and now the division of nations to be scattered had nothing to do with the color of skin. The division was linguistically promoted. That God confounded the language. The place was called Babel and the people began to scatter abroad and everyone scattered according to their language. That God disrupted the language in the human family. So much and so that even now when the nations of, that are represented here come together even today. That we're going to come together and we're going to have a meeting. We, the leaders have to put earphones on. So they can be able to understand the languages of all the representations that have come to the table. It's important for us to understand God in all of this because I want us to fast forward to, to the day that God gave all of us the great commission. He says, I want you now to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What, what is interesting is, is in the great commission, the word that, that, that emerges from that is ethnos. And it, it is all of the people groups that God wants all the people groups to be saved. That's what he wants. No matter if you're descended from Shem, if you're descended from Ham, or you're descended from Japheth. What, what God wants is, God wants all the people groups to be saved. So much and so that, that when we come to the book of Acts chapter 2 and we come to the day of Pentecost, and if you look at the list of the people who came to Pentecost, it mirrors almost the exact group of people that we find in Genesis chapter 10 in the table of nations. So here in Genesis chapter 10 and 11, God confounds the language because the people are lifted up with pride and they want to commit 
idolatry against the Lord through their pride, but God wants the people to be saved. God wants all the ethnos to be saved. God wants all the people of the earth to be saved. So what does God do? God gives the gift of tongues. God allows the disciples to be able to speak languages that they have never learned before. Why did he do that? Because God wants people to be saved. God wanted the gospel to be heard. And what they said, wow, these men are drunk. Peter said, we ain't drunk. It ain't but the third hour of the day. Ain't that right? You don't get drunk at nine o'clock, do you? How many? What? Just checking. Not at nine o'clock. Maybe 12, maybe three, maybe six, but not. He said, it's the third hour of the day. We haven't been drinking. This is this Holy Spirit. And the people said, wow, we hear every man speaking in our language. There's a beautiful scene in the consummation of history. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. John has a throne scene and listen to what he says. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, kindreds and people, tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. I like that. Because what that means is just what the Great Commission was for. That God's love to the world is not based on the color of someone's skin. God loves the world. He wants the world to be saved. And so the Europeans of Japheth, the Semitic people of Shem, the African people of Ham, all represented in the throne scene because of a desire that God is willing that none perish, but that all come to repentance. What we're going to see in the weeks to come is a representation of North Africa in the Egyptians and how there is intermarriage with the Israelites. We're going to see the Ethiopians. All my years I've heard sermons on the prophet Jeremiah. But never did I hear a sermon about the Africans who saves Jeremiah's life. In all my years, I've heard missionary calls. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work that I will call you to, that church in Antioch. But when you look at the names, African leaders are in the church at Antioch. The eunuch that comes to Christ is from Ethiopia. There's definitely an African presence in the scripture. It's going to help us in our own thinking to realize that God wants all people to be saved. Father, we thank you so much for your word today and that your word is true. We're so thankful for an absence of emphasis 
on color when it comes to dignity in the word of God. Helping us to see that in the church, that what you're looking for are people from every nation, every kindred, every color, every language to come to salvation in Jesus Christ. Historically, there has been a neglect of any representation from Africa in preaching through flannel graph, pictures. And so we want to also come to the reality that there needed to be no movement. We didn't have to depend on a song to let us know that I'm black, but I'm beautiful. If I'm white, I'm beautiful. If I'm red, I'm beautiful. Because it's your sovereignty that has made us and not we ourselves. Help us. May the truth set us free in our minds. Help us to spread the message that there's an African presence in the scriptures because God wants none to perish. May we understand that there's no curse on any one group of people, but all of us are born in sin and we need a savior. Those who advocated even for a climate racism, help us that when we look at someone else, we're seeing dignity because they are an image bearer of the creator. Though marred, yet still remaining. Bless your word to our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. While every head is bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, there might be someone here today you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. God loves you. He sent Jesus to die for you. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. If you'd like to be saved, we invite you to come. We'll take you to the word of God to show you the way. Maybe you're already a Christian without a church home. You'd like to unite your fellowship. We'd love to have you in our Bible Baptist family. Or maybe you're just someone who's standing in the need of prayer. Let's all stand together.